The international system is facing accelerated transitions as competition between the great powers intensifies. Join this important dialogue with the Kingston Consortium on International Security. Good morning and welcome to the Kingston Conference on International Security. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Wendy Tokash, one of the visiting defense fellows studying here at Queens throughout the through the Army War College. And the, our other master of ceremonies for tomorrow will be Colonel Ryan Jarkowski, the Canadian visiting defense fellow. Uh, before we get started, I just have a few administrative points that I need to share. Uh, please turn off the ringer and volume on your phones and digital devices. However, if you would like to share about your experience here at CASIS with us on social media, uh, please don't forget to tag us at the KCIS, hashtag CASIS 2022, and hashtag High North. Uh, we have the location of the fire exits, which are located uh, through the doorways on the left. The fire exits are stairwells go down. You cannot come up the, the stairwells. Uh, the location of the washroom was right by the elevators out in the hallway where you checked in. And then we also will be taking scheduled breaks throughout the, the conference with coffee available. I know we ran out of coffee earlier. We have more coming. We've been working on that. Uh, I know we can't continue the conference without it. So um, uh, this conference is also going to be on video. So please be aware of where the cameras are if you stand up while the discussion is in progress and please be courteous to those around you. Uh, food will be served in the Island Ballroom uh, at the east end of the hallway. Some of you had breakfast with us this morning, so it'll be the same location for lunch. Uh, there is simultaneous translation. So if you wish headsets to, to get a headset, please go to the audio visual table in the back of the room. And then there will be a question and answer session following each panel after all panelists have finished speaking. The conference aides will be in the room with microphones. So if you have a question, please stand and raise your hand to ask your question and a, an aide will come over with a microphone so that those attending online can also hear what's being said. So if you don't have a microphone, um, it, it's very hard to hear if it, for those panelists that are dialing in. Uh, the attendees online will also be able to send in questions for the panel. Uh, they just will type them in and the moderators will get those questions and be able to share them. So with that, I'd like to get us started. Uh, our host for today's conference is Stephanie, Dr. Stephanie Von Plackley, who serves as the director for the Center of the International and Defense Policy. And she recently transitioned to step up as the Associate Dean in Research for the Faculty of Arts and Sciences here at Queens University. So welcome, Stephanie. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Colonel Tokach, for these kind words of introductions. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be back. Full room. Uh, I have to say, Elder Wendy Phillips from the Office of Indigenous Initiatives at Queen's University fell ill, so she won't be joining us this morning to do the land welcome. Uh, we will proceed with a land acknowledgement and the challenge to the conference, and I'm delighted to share the stage with Brigadier General Janine Burkhead today. Okay, to begin, let us acknowledge that we are situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. To acknowledge the land in this way is to recognize its longer history, one predating the establishment of the earliest European colonies. It is also to acknowledge this territory's significance for the indigenous peoples who lived and continue to live upon it and whose practices and spiritualities were and continue to be tied to the land. It's fall convocation this week at Queen's University. And if you were to hear our chancellor speak, the Honorable Justice Murray Sinclair, Chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, he would point to education as the key to reconciliation. He says that education got us into this mess and education will get us out of it. We keep those words in mind as we pursue our academic journey at Queens as professors, staff, and students. Indigenous ties to the land are also a core part 
uh, of our conference. When we talk about international competition in the high north, listening to indigenous perspectives and traditional ways of knowing broadens our understanding of security. And that is part and parcel of the challenge we pose to you this morning as speakers, participants, attendees. And as international competition flares up, we challenge you to imagine a secure and sustainable circumpolar north. You will see from the program that you will have that our survey of the international security landscape is not limited to great powers and military assets, but also involves people, diplomacy, development, a very fragile ecosystem and very resilient communities. So striking that balance is key and is complex work. And that's why there are so many of us today in this room and that we're showing up this early in the morning. The Kingston Conference on International Security is an ideal platform for those exchanges on such an important topic. It is a collaborative undertaking that we celebrated last evening during the reception. It is a consortium of partners, including the Queen's Center for International and Defense Policy, the Canadian Army Doctrine and Training Center, the Strategic Studies Institute at the US Army War College and the NATO Defense College in Rome. This international partnership is reflected on our program, and it is through this network that we harness the expertise of civilian and military officials, academics, as well as representatives from the private sector and civil society. Now, I'm delighted to introduce you to Brigadier General Janine Burkhead this morning. Uh, General Burkhead serves as the commander of the Maryland Army National Guard and is dual-headed as the Deputy Commandant for Reserve Affairs at the U.S. Army War College. After holding several command assignments, Brigadier General Burkhead served as the Director of Legislative Affairs for the Maryland National Guard. In terms of operational experience in 2004, she mobilized under OEF-OIF, serving as the Tiger Team Leader and Designated Military Officer for the Office of Administrative Review for the Detention of Enemy Combatants. In 2011, Brigadier General Burkhead deployed as the Deputy Current Operations Securing Partnerships and International Security Assistance Force in Kabul, Afghanistan. In January of 2021, she was called to lead Task Force Capital, commanding over 15,000 soldiers as well as airmen and women. Upon her completion of this assignment, the governor appointed her to lead the first of its kind Vaccine Equity Task Force. Brigadier General Burkhead's military decorations, to name only a few, and you have the full bio in your program, include the Legion of Merit, Defense Meritorious Service Medal, Army Commendation Medal, National Defense Service Medal, Armed Forces Reserve Medal, NATO Medal, and Afghanistan Campaign Medal. In her civilian capacity, Ms. Burkhead is a senior advisor for the Bureau of Trust Funds Administration, formerly the Office of the Special Trustee for American Indians at the U.S. Department of the Interior in Washington, D.C. I'll turn it over to you, Brigadier General Janine Burkhead, for sharing your thoughts on our challenge for the conference. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Uh, for highlighting the significance and the timeliness of this conference and celebrating the diversity of perspectives and the people who were here before. Uh, those voices are so important and it's important to remember that. Uh, we are pleased to represent the US Army War College, uh, Major General David Hill, the Commandant. Um, we're so glad to be here to participate in this gathering. I'm proud that we have all joined together to address the Arctic as both challenge and opportunity. I'm proud that our Strategic Studies Program Institute provided geopolitical analysis that informed the U.S. Army's Army Strategic Strategy. And for 16 years, the U.S. Strategic Studies Institute and the Kingston Consortium on International Security have role modeled international dialogue and championed U.S.-Canadian coordination to examine critical national security issues. Our dialogue this week can be the seeds for change. So I'd like to address our roles and responsibilities while here. 
at a conference of this type, the heavy lift is usually those people who are presenting. They have deliberated on their insights and their experiences, and that they've done their research to present you with new information and new perspectives that will influence your thinking about economic security, national security, environmental security, and the defense of the Arctic. And the rest of us, we will ask questions. We will represent our fields of study. We will represent our agencies and nations during these discussions. We will no doubt prepare reports for our headquarters, right? And yet I propose that those rules, roles are merely the beginning of our responsibilities. I hope that these discussions will inspire you, inspire all of us to keep thinking about these issues and more importantly, to keep communicating about these goals and opportunities as they emerge. We may not reach consensus on the way ahead today, but we are changed by recognizing what could be. We've been here before on the cusp of change in the new world. In the Americas, great powers sought natural resources and economic power. In Africa, great powers claimed lands to access and control the unique natural resources and economic, economic opportunities. Today, great power competition over the lands of Central Asia continues. China builds roads, refines, refineries, power lines, and they advance their Belt and Road Initiative. Russia continues the 19th century great game with dams, hydro prior uh, plants, and its military bases. And now, as we look to the future for the emerging Arctic economic zone, we have the opportunity to learn from the missteps of the past, to seek economic opportunity that benefits the people of the region, at least as much as the investors. Do we believe we can create shared opportunity, economic security, national security, environmental security? Do we believe we can defy the patterns of our history? We are adequately confident in the power of integrated security to underwrite new patterns of development that distribute benefits. It's not easy, it's not an easy argument for taxpayers and corporations and politicians, we know that. There's always been tension between the practical imperatives of realist national security and the idealist of international security cooperation. And we know that as well. That's why I ask you and I urge you to think deeply about the information and perspectives you confront this week and continue the conversation at your home agencies in professional writings and in your interactions with policymakers and politicians alike. To be candid, it will take an enormous commitment to shared interest, shared values, and to decline our own self-interest. Will the Arctic become a zone of military standoff? Or will we make the hard decisions and take the more complicated road toward international cooperation in the high North? Like many in this room, I've dedicated my career to advancing security for the Americas. As an army officer, as a civilian employee of the US Department of Interior, I know the, effect, the challenges we face. If we took the long view now, we now know the environmental security is intertwined with national security. We know now that respect for human security and economic security is intertwined with national security. Each, is a, each of us here today is multifaceted. Among us are humanitarians, scientists, strategists, long-term planners, gamers, analytical thinkers. We all are people of multiple interests and passions. I hope you will conclude that the challenge is worth your interest and passion. We can help set a new azimuth for our nations as we question the assumptions, explore options, and reset expectations for the emerging new Arctic. It will take all of us. Thank you, Brigadier General Burkhead, for identifying these 
key questions. Those questions are very important as part of the, the challenge, not only to inform our discussions right here in this room, but also for the work that follows. Uh, you'll notice in the hallway that we've got some KCIS publications and we really strive to push out some of the key insights from this conference into short briefs and a conference volume. Uh, we're ready to dive into our discussions, but I want to just take a moment to consider some of the key developments from the past year. I was telling uh, those of you who attended yesterday's reception at the RMC Senior Staff Officers Mess that uh, you know we plan these conferences over a year. It's really a 12-month planning cycle. And it's always a challenge to identify a theme that will resonate a year later. And I think in this case, uh, you know, it's uh, the, the theme of international competition in the heart, high north has gained a new significance, uh, you know, not, not for reasons to celebrate, but uh, let us take a moment of pause to, to think about what's happened. Not only is the world recovering from a global pandemic, but there is a full scale conventional war in Europe. And even though that's a completely different region than the one as our focus uh, today, uh, the fact that uh, there is this war in Europe completely changes our security perceptions of the high north and in the Arctic. And so we're seeing the Arctic not just as a, a region in itself, but uh, definitely as a microcosm of that greater uh, great power uh, competition. The events of the past year have also pushed NATO allies closer together. And I think it's important to highlight that, especially with the NATO Defense College Research Division uh, being such an important partner in this conference. So that the NATO Alliance has opened the door to new member states. You have Sweden and Finland joining the alliance, bringing the members, the total membership to 32 allies. And what this means for our theme of uh, international competition in the high north is that you've got this new cluster of circumpolar allies within that NATO template. And that's important for us to consider as well in terms of how Canada, for example, positions itself within the alliance. So I think we can expect that that will no doubt change NATO's approach to its northern flank. I know the NATO Defense College just issued a publication on that very topic, NATO's northern flank, so look out for that. And uh, what's interesting also from a Canadian perspective is that Canada has always wanted to kind of avoid raising Arctic security in the NATO context. And I think that we can expect that to change more and more. Certainly, the Secretary General's visit to Canada's north over the summer, summer signals that there was a lot of media attention around that visit. And as Canada makes new investments into NORAD capabilities and starts thinking a bit more ambitiously about continental defense, it has an interest in doing so not just to improve North American security, but as a visible contribution to transatlantic security. In Canada, Arctic security is a priority like it has never been before, and it's garnering greater attention across the government of Canada and the Canadian Armed Forces. So I'm, I'm happy that we've got uh, both civilian and military representation in the room uh, to, to weigh in. So we'll have to be doing our part here over the course of the next two days to engage with the themes you see in your program and the questions that were posed to you by Brigadier General Janine Burkhead. And so use the mics here in the room, use Twitter if that's your thing. And we have lots of people joining us uh, virtually. So let me wish everyone a wonderful conference and thank you so much for being here. Next will be Brigadier General Todd Strickland, the Commandant of the Canadian Forces College, who will open up our keynote speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, just before I um, bring Mr. Hyder up to the stage and to the podium, just ask you to join me in giving the team at Queens who've done so much of the heavy lifting and Maureen Bertram in particular, I'm not even sure if she's in the room, a quick hand, but uh, thanks to the team. <laughs> and
and, and I do acknowledge that it's far more than Marine that has actually put this together. And there's a whole raft of people, military and civilian, Queens, Canadian Army Can Command and Staff College and others that have uh, put things together. But Maureen, uh, it's a labor of love, I think, for her. So with that being said, um, in my day job, I'm the Commandant of the Canadian Forces College in Toronto. And I spend a lot of time trying to equip our students who are middle and senior level executives or soon to be uh, middle and senior level executives with different lenses. And it's my dream that our students walk away with a multitude of lenses with which to analyze a problem. And this morning, we're privileged to have someone who's able to bring at least seven different lenses to any problem set that we face. And I'm talking, of course, about Mr. Goldie Hyder, who is at once um, a businessman, a policy crafter, a strategist, a leader, philanthropist, an advocate for volunteerism, um, and dare I say, an academic um, from out of uh, University of Cal University of Calgary, uh, where he's got a Master of Arts in Public Policy. Um, from 2014 to 2018, he was the President and Chief Executive Officer of Hill Nolan Strategies, where he was advising on communications in particular. He's also been the Director of Policy and the Chief of Staff to a former Prime Minister in uh, the Right Honourable Joe Clark. He's active with several charities non and non-profits, um, including being the Chair of the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada's Asia Business Leaders, Advisory Council, sits on advisory boards for Catalyst Canada, the 30% Club. He's a member of the selection board for a seat at, a seat at the table, and he's a past co-chair of the United Way of Ottawa's campaign cabinet. He is uniquely um, set to give his perspective on competition in the Arctic. So without further ado, Mr. Hyder. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to uh, great to be here with you. Let me start with a few basic things, if I can. Um, first of all, I want to thank my friend Hugh Siegel, who's not here. I don't see him anyways, for the kind invite. Um, he saw me or heard me speak on an issue with Korea the other day, and so I'm grateful to him. Um, secondly, thank you for all that you do. Uh, it's a very important when uh, we appreciate the work that each and every one of you do on behalf of Canadians on a daily basis, more often than not unnoticed. And so I just want to thank you on a personal level for that. Thirdly, I want to acknowledge that I'm one of those people who was deprived of coffee this morning. And this is a very serious national emergency for me, uh, because it means that I can at least use the, the excuse that I was not drug aided as I spoke today. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be able to um, have some plausible deniability of whatever it is that I said was because I hadn't had coffee also. So we'll see how it goes. Um, but in all seriousness, um, to follow on uh, Brigadier General Burkhead's uh, remarks is very apropos. It's as if we had spoken um, before, which is um, always good when, or when that works out. I want to begin by really just talking about, from a macro level, what we're seeing as, as business leaders, and I think what we should be seeing as Canadians. And that is simply this. The world has changed. The world has changed and it's not going back. So if anybody who's waiting for it to go back, you'll be waiting a very long time. And there's a fundamental shift that's taken place. Uh, Larry Summers, um, whom some of you may recognize the name, a former de a Democrat advisor and Commerce Secretary and others to, uh, to uh, Bill Clinton, um, said, it's a time for a new seriousness. And I couldn't agree with him more, that the level of conversations that we've been enjoying over the last 30 or 40 years or so has allowed us to get away from the, the threats that do exist in the world. And where we are, find ourselves today is um, we're separating the serious people, the serious countries from the pretenders. And I think it's really important that Canada be lumped in that serious group. And so that's why I was pleased to accept the, uh, the invite. Um, ultimately, our national security um, is, is a, a an economic issue as well for business leaders. We if we don't have national security. It's going to be pretty hard to have a vibrant um, economy that's growing, that's attracting capital, that's attracting talent. So, the North itself, uh, in terms of of what's taking place, and you know, I'm speaking to people who know this well, and that is that climate change has made the North more accessible in terms of the North the, uh, the Northwest Passage. And obviously, when your northern neighbor is Russia and uh, China and its expansion are increasing their presence there, and they're using it as a trade corridor. And frankly, it's an area of dispute with the United States as well, who also wants to use it as a, as a trade corridor. And I think it's extremely important that Canada 
assert its claim that these are not um, you know, international waters. These are internal waters. This is Canadian, um, not soil, but Canadian water. And we've got to make sure that in order to do that, you have the capacity to defend it. You can't just lay claim to something being yours, but if I come and take it, there's nothing you can do about it, then I guess it isn't yours, it's mine. And so we've got to make sure that we are doing what we need to do to assert that claim, but to um, have the capacity to defend that, that claim. We have to leverage uh, clearly from an economic perspective, the trade route that it, it is, it's great potential for Port of Churchill and uh, going through um, via Hudson Bay, if you will. And so the assertion of sovereignty and region to secure these natural resources, I mean, the whole world is focused right now on energy and critical minerals and agriculture, food, but particularly those former two, two things is what anywhere you go, people are talking about. Think about the attention Canada just received in the last six or eight weeks. The Chancellor of Germany, the Vice Chancellor of Germany, uh, the President of Korea, a delegation from Japan. Uh, President Macron was supposed to come here and will come here, but he didn't come here because there's an election going on. Ursula from the head of the EU, she's supposed to be here, she'll come again because there's an election going on. When is the last time you remember that level of, of tension, that level of love uh, for Canada? It's been a long time. And there's a reason. We have what the world wants. We have what the world wants. And that's that's the good news part of this. Unfortunately, it doesn't all um, continue. And the reason is we just don't have the infrastructure. We haven't invested in the northern infrastructure. We talk a great game. We, we talk a great game. Doing is becoming a little harder for us. And we've got to get serious that if you are going to lay assertion to the sovereignty, you got to be able to assert it. You got to be able to defend it. You got to be able to show it. You got to be able to demonstrate it that it is, in fact, ours. So we must build a, a network of northern infrastructure in this decade. This is not something that we continue to talk about for a decade. We need to get going. Uh, a lot of attention has been put on the Arctic. I mean, I look back at the former conservative government, others, the prime minister's, you know, summer visits regularly and drawing attention because politically you're talking about a region with, you know, three or five seats or whatever the, the number is. Politically, it's not the best use of your time, but your fiduciary duty as the leader of a country is first and foremost, it's national security. And if you don't do that, then you're liable for everything that comes as a consequence of that. So if you don't build the infrastructure, then that's part of the problem of being able to lay uh, to lay claim for it. It includes export enabling infrastructure. Canada is a trading nation, has been, will, is, and will continue to be a trading nation. But if you can't get your product to market to your customer, the customer moves on. I'm going to come come to that uh, later on in, in in some of my remarks to demonstrate to you that that this is exactly what's happening because we haven't built the infrastructure, particularly build up our energy infrastructure so that we can actually power the northern communities. We don't have the capacity to, to do that today. So, you know, you're not going to be able to get people to move in if you tell them we can't give you light. <laughs> if we can't give you heat, that would be a bit of a problem. So we've got to invest in that kind of energy infrastructure. And I do believe very strongly in my members uh, who represent uh, 175 CEOs, 50% of the Toronto Stock Exchange, 2 million employees, a multiple of three or four in the supply chains, another 68. These are proud, for the most part, proud Canadians. There's a number of them that are that are not Canadians, but they run in Canadian companies or some Canadian subsidiaries and saying, you know, I want to make sure that Canada is doing its part on climate change, for example. This is a, a major priority of the business community because it's a major priority for our customer. It's the right thing to do. It's happening and we need to lead the way because at the end of the day, governments form policy. Same with you. You have to execute the policy. We have to execute their policies. At the end of the day, the innovation on climate change is largely going to come from the private sector. Carbon capture, small modular nuclear reactors, blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, gray hydrogen. Those are the colors I've already heard about. There may be a rainbow of them eventually, but all of these things are private sector led. Right? So we've got to have the environment in which the infrastructure is there. But to get the infrastructure, we have to have the environment in which capital can form. That's a very important component um, of this as well. So if you care about the climate, we've got to make sure we create a policy framework that allows for capital to form, innovation to occur. I'll be very candid with you. The vast majority of people, if not everybody, who's made a net zero commitment probably doesn't know how they're going to do it by 2050, <clears throat> right? And many of them are struggling with the idea of making a promise without knowing how they're going to do it. Many will tell you very candidly that we're probably only going to meet, that they have the, the know-how today 
they have the know-how to reduce emissions by about 50%. All right, so we'll get to our 2030 targets, our 2035 targets, probably fairly comfortably, and nuclear is going to have to be a big component of that. Okay? How are we going to the other 50%? We don't know. The people who are brutally honest with you will tell you, they don't know. We're counting on things like carbon capture and small modular nuclear reactors and hydrogen and the ability to get it there. Right? It's not just something that you can say, you actually have to do and businesses have to do that. And clearly something like SMRs, uh, the modular reactors can be used to replace diesel, for example, in Northern uh, northern communities. So these are mid-size uh, nuclear nuclear um, reactors, uh, obviously safer and, 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 and under development and all of that. Hydrogen is clearly a, an opportunity to reduce reliance on uh, diesel as well. So main message section sort of point, point two that I've made beyond the economic security point is in order to have economic security, you must modernize and upgrade our national security infrastructure. And this is, as I said, the number one job of anyone who wants to be prime minister is to keep us safe is to protect our sovereignty, is to ensure that someone just can't come and take your minerals and leave. Someone is not fishing in your area. Someone, you have to be able to defend that sovereignty. So that's the number one priority. Unfortunately, it's not a very politically popular thing to do because people see it as a choice. What about my roads? What about my bridges? What about my, my needs? You know? So we've got to ensure that our political narrative has room and space to be able to talk about what it is that is ultimately most important to us, which is our sovereignty, which is our security. And if we can't frame that as to mattering to, you know, you know, um, Martha and Henry, uh, you know, in Kingston, well, we're not going to get their vote. Right. So we have to make sure we're communicating to them the importance of national security and sovereignty and how that keeps them free and how that allows them to worry about their roads and their bridges and their schools. If we don't have that, you don't have to worry about your roads and bridges. Someone else is probably running your country and your life. So we've got to make sure we connect those dots for them. And I think we all have a duty. And we all have a duty, business, academia, the military itself, and governments to communicate more effectively and tell the stories that need to be told to Canadian public. Because if there's one reason I still sleep well at night, despite all the challenges that we faced, is I have tremendous confidence in the collective wisdom of Canadians. If you give them good information, if you share with them facts, if you ask them the right questions, even if they never thought about the issue before, give them the opportunity to get together like this and talk. I promise you, they will come up with the right answer. They always do. They've never certainly let me down. And I think that if we engage them more on these kinds of issues, you will build up from this floor, the public support, and from this other area, the political support, and the two shall meet to say, this has to be a priority of ours. And it can't be something that we just talk about. Which brings me to our international standing, which is we do a really good job talking about things when it comes to honoring our commitments uh, to our allies. We don't. We don't. So we have to acknowledge the need to honor our commitments to our NATO and NORAD allies. And we at the Business Council of Canada, despite really being focused on economic competitiveness uh, on behalf of Canadian businesses and Canadians uh, writ large, in fact, called for in the last budget, uh, and I wrote very specifically as a separate letter to Minister Freeland because the war broke out after we had already submitted our budget uh, submission, saying, you know, Minister, this is, uh, a, a, this is a moment in history where we're going to be judged as to what we did to respond to this threat. And we need to up our game in terms of our military spending. Now, I'm normally a guy who wants to see deficits down, debt down, and you know, uh, in, not increase spending in government. But again, is it wise to not invest in your own commitments to, to be a part of an organization that's going to help keep you safe, that is going to help keep you sovereign, as, as NATO uh, and NORAD would? So we wrote about that. We suggested to them that they should increase the spend in defense and show the trajectory towards our 2% commitment. Uh, and to do so by actually finding uh, savings in program review. And believe it or not, that is exactly what was announced in the budget, that we're going to put six to nine billion dollars in the defense, and we're going to find six to nine billion dollars in savings in program review. So in other words, it costs taxpayers nothing. It's going to be found in efficiency and all, which means we actually have capacity to add to that six to nine billion dollars in new spending as the economy continues to grow, as revenues continue to grow as a result, ironically, about rising oil prices. So you can see the connectivity between some of these issues, and which is why I believe that we need to have a very adult conversation about climate change 
economic security and national security, because you can't separate those three. Those are all connected, and we have to have that conversation um, in that fashion. And I can tell you that when I'm in Washington, where I just came back from, arrived here like at 1 a.m. last night, um, I was here, I was in Washington hearing Minister Freeland give her speech. If you've not had a chance to read her speech from last night, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, it was um, a refreshingly uh, serious prescription for democracies around the world as to how we should respond uh, to what's taking place. But words need to be backed up with actions. So they need to be backed up with actions on investing in the military, in our national security, in cybersecurity, and in um, the infrastructure more broadly, as I spoke about. So it, it is encouraging that we are having those conversations. But when I'm in Washington, what I hear about from them is, I want to talk about trade, and they want to talk about defense. And so it's, it's not lost on you when you go down there that this is a sore spot for them that says, hey, you're, you're, to some extent, you're freeloading. You take us for granted that, you know, given where you are, we will do whatever it takes to protect you. And that's probably true, but that doesn't make it the right thing to do, right? If your neighbor left their house open, doesn't mean you just go in and help yourself to food. <laughs> it's not how this is supposed to work. You have a fiduciary duty, you have a duty uh, to meet your obligations. And America is certainly calling us out on that. And we in the business community feel that that relationship needs to be as strong as ever, because we can't be on the wrong side of the G1. We have to make sure that we have strong relationships with the United States. Uh, and if this is an area of importance to them, we need to show them that we're doing something about it. Right? Doesn't mean you do what they want. Doesn't mean you spend as much as they want. It just means you, you acknowledge that this is perceived gap uh, in Canada's ability to be seen as a reliable partner and a reliable actor um, in the region. You know, they do actually want us to guard our own borders. They don't want to be responsible for guarding our borders and a lot of other borders around the world. And so we should do our part to do that. And the president has been quite clear, President Biden, that he won't give one inch, he said. He won't give one inch. And that includes the Arctic in terms of, of ensuring that America is safe and that borders are protected. And so we need to move away from the brand of being freeloaders and or not pulling our weight uh, around the world because, as I said, things are getting serious. And so let me revert to the example I thought I would share with you. Um, I mentioned the German chancellor came here and the German vice chancellor is actually a member of the Green Party came here. They originally came here for wanting to talk about uh, LNG, liquid, uh, liquid, liquefied natural gas, which is a transitory fuel that is better on emissions uh, than, than other sources of, of uh, fossil fuels. And it is sought after around the world. And we're building a very large project in, uh, in the coast of Kitimat there in BC, uh, which will be ready in 2025, almost entirely funded by foreign, um, foreign companies and foreign governments to take LNG to Asia, which is a very positive development. 2025, we'll get that on. But it's a long ways to go from there to Europe. So we'd like to see something come out from the East Coast. And so Germany came looking for LNG. They were basically told, please don't talk about LNG. We want to talk about hydrogen because we want to focus on the green transition. And it's green, 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 green. Okay. So they, we weren't good hosts, but they were good guests. They tried not to talk about it. But, you know, the media is not stupid. They ask questions. They were on panels. They ask questions. They said, sir, if you could be offered LNG, would you take it? Well, he said, of course I would take it. Why? Because you and I are going to see some shocking, shocking videos this winter of people in Germany freezing. That's not an exaggeration that I'm making up. The people who know about this stuff are saying to me, you need to be conscious that what's going to happen in Europe as a lack of energy is shocking. It's a G7 country, a leading democracy in the world is telling people, don't turn the heat past 18 degrees. It's a criminal offense now to do so. Like, just pause there for a second and think about that. Right? That's the state of play here. So it can't be we're just going to talk about climate change and we're just going to talk about the green transition and we're going to just invest in future technologies when there is a real immediate present need and danger <laughs> to some extent. Because the longer it takes us, the, lo the more the autocratic uh, countries provide oil and gas to democracies like Germany. That's what they want to wean themselves off. And what they're asking Canada, amongst others, is do you have the capacity? Will you have the capacity? Can you develop the capacity to get your cleaner LNG, more environmentally sensitive, ESG standards, CSR standards? I mean, our members are subject to some of the highest as they want to be and should be. 
standards on how they run their businesses. You think that's the question in Saudi Arabia or Venezuela or Iran? Come on. So everybody's landlocking our oil, our gas, don't want to talk about our nuclear resources stuff. And meanwhile, sales from, you know, I mean, the president of the United States takes a gas can to Saudi Arabia, to Venezuela and Iran looking for oil. I'm like, have you heard of Canada? Like, we got a bit of that. We could get you some of that. And it's a conversation that's not being had because the agenda has been effectively hijacked. I, my team gets upset when I use that word, but I don't know what else to call it. But it's been hijacked by this, we're all going to die if we don't deal with climate change today. That's an irresponsible statement to make. We are going to have to manage that. And if the word transition is in this phrase itself, green transition, it's not green on, green off. or no, That's not what we're talking about. It is and not or. And so we're going to need to get LNG to market. So what happens is we tell them to not talk about it. They go home empty-handed. Now, in fairness, we couldn't get them LNG today because we don't have the facilities and the infrastructure to do so. But since then, Germany has gone to Australia. 16-year contract for LNG. Okay, Australia is three times farther away from Germany than Canada is. So if you care about the climate, you've just made emissions worse as ships go from Germany to, uh, to Australia and, and back and forth. Okay? They signed another agreement with the UAE. Then they, this week, or last week, I forgot what date is today, last week signed an agreement with the United States to get more LNG. So a country that came to Canada and said, you have a lot of this. If you build a capacity, you'll be able to get it to us. We're here to buy. We sent them home empty-handed. When I was in Korea in May, a Korean, and uh, you know, it's not in the Asian culture, I can say as an Asian myself, to, to, to be this bold about a comment in a diplomatic meeting. But a dip, deputy minister said to me, we consider Canada as hoarding their energy. I'm like, hang on a minute, we have a global brand of being nice. Like, how can we possibly be hoarders if we're nice? But it goes to show you when the moment shifts and people say, I need something and I'm looking to you because you have it in abundance and you can't get it to me. Well, I can only assume you're being greedy. So we've got to be cognizant of the world is desperate for what we have. We have it in abundance and we need to get it to them. And the North and the Arctic will be a critical uh, passageway to be able to do some of, uh, of the things that I am uh, that I'm talking about. So if you want to help Germany, if you want to help Western democracies, if you want to help those in-between countries that aren't quite autocratic and stuff, let's make sure we can reduce their reliance on what I call autocratic oil or autocratic gas and increase the capacity from them to get it from friendlies um, like, uh, like us. And so let me end with that by simply just saying that Canada's north is really the front line in many ways for our national and economic security. Thank you. You got some. You got questions for me. So, um, we just see if the microphone works here. Um, are there questions from the floor? First of all, they haven't had coffee either. It looks like no. <laughs> I did see coffee get brought in, so that is um, that's a step in the right direction. This is that Canadian moment where everybody looks to the other to ask the first question. Surely, to goodness, I said something that you don't agree with or you want to ask about. <laughs> so, to start things off, just because. It, I'm a Canadian general, and if no one talks, I, I kind of, I'll take on that role. Um, so the question I have is, you talked a lot, a lot about dialogue and about connection and about the interconnectivity of the issues. And quite frankly, um, the dialogue and national security within Canada is one-sided. Uh, it's done by pr practitioners, but trying to convince the vast majority of Canadians who live uh, within 100 kilometers of the uh, U.S. border, that Arctic security is an issue. It seems like we're tilting at windmills, if I can mix my metaphors. Um, so understanding your background, how do we create a broader dialogue on national security and Arctic security in particular with Canadians? It's a deep question because um, am I my prior iteration from this role was running a public relations company where I was there for 17 years. And public relations company is exactly that, about relations with the public. And what I watched happen in, in uh, not just in Canada, but frankly around the world, is the, the, the arrival of social media has deprived us of political leadership now. They're largely become followers. Right? And so that is the threat to democracy if 
if there go my people, let me get ahead of them to lead is the new model of leadership. As the old Chinese proverb is probably not what I call leadership, right? Leadership is actually about taking a stand about um, being able to describe with purpose and with mission and vision what it is that our objective is and what we're trying to do. And it may not be popular, but let's talk about it, right? Let's figure out how to build that consensus. And that's not happening today because of social media in my mind. We polarized ourselves and black is, is black and white is white and there's nothing in between. And, you know, I spent a lot of time in the US. They don't agree that it's a cloudy day today. Half of them are watching, you know, uh, snow falling or half of them are watching sunny days and they're being told that's what it is in Kingston today. And they believe it. So how do you insert leadership into a world like that? First problem. Second problem is Canada is not immune. Like we, I'm a, you won't find a prouder Canadian than I am. I mean, I am an immigrant here and stuff, but like everything I'm doing is about my worry about Canada's place in the world today, tomorrow and the day after and what it is I'm leaving behind for my kids and grandkids. Because unfortunately, all of us in this room are responsible as the first generation of Canadians to not be leaving behind a Canada that is going to be stronger economically, socially, politically, than, and, and uh, for, certainly from a military perspective, than what our ancestors have done. Every generation before us made life better for the next generation. But if you look at the climate, if you look at the economic issues around deficits and debt, if you look at a variety of other issues, poverty still remains, so many things. I just gave a speech to 750 kids at Ivy. I know I shouldn't say that at a Queen's event, but uh, they invited me. Uh, I'm from Calgary, so it doesn't really matter. Um, you know, they, they, I told these kids, I said, look, I'm sorry to come here and get serious with you, but we let you down. And in some ways, you guys are a bit of the problem here, right? Because they're all about, oh, let's just save the planet and all this other stuff, which is all critically important. But we got to talk honestly about what that looks like. And so what we did was we said, okay, in the world in which there's no political leadership, we will offer it. We will speak up. You know, we're here and we're doing a lot of things. And people say, what, what are you doing there? Well, because we're trying to build something here, number one. Secondly, we're saying, who is the voice for what my father says is where most Canadians reside in the radical middle of public policy discourse, that we're neither extreme right wing and we're not extreme left wing, that most part Canadians, even when they chose liberal and conservative governments and they alternated, you know, a little bit on this side and a little bit on that side, but generally the trajectory of the country was, you know, why did the Canadian cross the road to get to the yellow line, right? Like, I mean, we, we found a way to be in the middle and, but now no more. Um, I, I'm not in the partisan business, so I won't comment, but I don't recognize traditional liberals party and traditional conservative party today. They have a constituency. In fact, they call themselves movements. I didn't study movements in political science. I studied political parties, but I didn't study movements. And now we've been basically, again, loaded word, hijacked, but you know, they, they, they mean well, but you, got, you can't have your own facts. <laughs> you, you gotta have the facts to be able to engage and to deal with the things that, that we're trying to deal with. Which brings me to the final point of how we did this is, we said, um, if Muhammad won't come to the mountain, <laughs> we'll bring the mountain to Muhammad. And, and we thought, well, if you can't beat them, the movements, because they're winning, they're clearly winning, right? I mean, let's face it, the agenda has been, has been both sides have had extreme agendas that, are, that they're advocating for. We said, what if we tried to build our own movement? What if we had the audacity to believe that people would respond to me calling them and saying, I want to bring together civil society in a room like this, people who just like me are worried about Canada, care about Canada, think that we can actually make a difference and shape the trajectory of the country for the positive. So I reached out, cold called union leaders, um, members of civil society, uh, academia, uh, academia, um, you know, um, indigenous groups, gender groups, LGBTQ groups, big business, small business, everybody but government. We told government, you can come and watch, but this ain't your meeting, this is our meeting. This is a meeting of the people. And we're gonna sit in here and we're gonna do a few things. One is we're gonna leave our partisanship at the door. <laughs> it's not about, you know, whether you're red, blue or orange or turquoise or whatever color you wanna be. And so we put Anne McClellan and Lisa Raitt, two people you should all know, very competent, capable, successful iterations of what I think political leadership is about. And said, Anne, Lisa, you guys love Canada as much as we all do. You co-chair this thing to send the signal that the partisanship's at the door. Number one. Number two, we said, leave your industry specific issues at the door. Don't come here and talk about small, small ball here. This is about one central question as Canadians. What do we need to do to make life better for our kids and our grandkids? When all is said and done, I asked many of these groups, you've had an, a, a government that's been on your agenda, gender, indigenous, racism, LGBT, all of these things. So I have a simple question. Seven years later, life's better, right? Like emissions are down because they're not. 
Gender equality, give me a break. COVID was way harder on women than it, than it was on, on, on men. Indigenous relations, I mean, I don't have to say anything about what's going on uh, in terms of, of, of a ch you know, church graveyards and stuff. Like we have not improved on these things, but we make ourselves feel good talking about it all the time. I said, well, that's the definition of insanity, right? You're going to go one more time to that well? What if it turns out to be the economy? What if you need to have a growing economy to help you know, uh, address the issues for Indigenous people, particularly around skills and reskilling and so forth. It's just a small example, equity, equity play and resources. All these things are issues that need to be discussed in an economic context. You know, we need childcare uh, because it disproportionately penalizes women than men who are stuck at home, but we need their productivity to our workforce. So we started bringing solutions and people said, well, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, because we're not talking black or white all the time. We're actually trying to talk about what needs to be done to bring people together. That group, which now is, uh, if you want to see, it's called canadacoalition.ca en français aussi. Um, I didn't want to embarrass myself in my Calgary French, but it's there in French also. And it's an example of the power of the people to come together to say, here's what we want for Canada. And guess what happened? A government whose initial reaction was, this looks like something business is doing to get tax cuts, which by the way, I've never asked for, um, now became clerk of the Privy Council, prime minister himself, uh, the finance minister, uh, the deputy minister of finance. The outreach has come from all of these people to say, tell us more. You know why? Because we did two things at the end of this coalition. One is we said, we want our governments to focus on three things. What is Canada's long-term economic growth strategy? Because I hate to tell you this, we don't have one. We have never had an industrial policy in our country. That's why you are underfunded the way you are and why America gets what it does because of DARPA. So we asked for a CARPA-like thing and said, let's invest strategically to grow our economy for the long term so we know the answer to the question, what do we want to be when we grow up? Because it can't be riding America's coattails on everything. You want to be sovereign? You want to be independent? Act like it. Okay? Secondly, we said, we have to lead the world in the green transition. And that this is not a false choice of shut down fossil fuels and switch to something else. We saw what happened in Europe. They just did that. They turned off nuclear. They turned off coal. And what happened? Gas prices went up 500% and the consumer said, whoa, I can't afford this. So yeah, I care about that, but I can't pay for it. And boom, you know, the Saudi Ramco minister said the other day or, or, or CEO said the other day, he goes, there's a transitioning happening, all right? Back to coal. Right. Because if you, if, you, if, you, if you look at what's going on around the world, all the pressure to renewable, renewable, renewable. So we said it's a responsible thing to do to plan that green transition. How do you do it? How do you get it right? And how do you bring the public with you and make it affordable for people, right? We said that. The third thing was, and this is really the, um, 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 the important piece here, is growing inequality in the country and, and being able to address that. But not in a fashion that says, let's rip other people down. How do we help other people up? How do we reskill our workforce for the future and give them hope that you're not going to be unemployed for the rest of your life? Because otherwise, you're going to see a Donald Trump in Canada. Donald Trump didn't build that parade. Donald Trump gave them voice. What he said is, I see you. I see you. I see the trade didn't work for you. And so we've got to make sure we don't let that happen here. And that means engaging on the issues that you know, the average person is talking about, which I think is affordability, inflation, you know, rising cost of living, all of these things, standard of living, uh, and basic infrastructure, like potholes in my streets. This is what Martha and Henry are talking about. Net zero 2050 shows up once in a while, maybe, but it's not what their predominant theme is the way you would think it would be uh, as it is in parliament. So we built this movement and then we put a scorecard to it with McKinsey, 20 OECD metrics. You guys and gals are all about metrics, I know, and we're in academia here. So you got to measure it. And we said, okay, here's how Canada ranks in 20 criteria, not chosen by business, not chosen by government, chosen by OECD, where OECD every year says, here's the, the 20 metrics for these countries. So now, you're going to be asked, well, last year you were 12th, this year you're 14th. What happened? So if we can put pressure on our governments to say we have higher expectations for you to respond, it's a long answer because it's, it's important you understand that, that I don't know who we're waiting for because the answer is us. If we're waiting to have some Messiah arrive and lead us to the promised land and a political leader, we will be waiting a long time. It's us. It's us working together. And it's us setting aside our self-interest and putting Canada ahead of everything else, then good things come from that. That's what we're advocating for. Andrew Schron from the University of Manitoba. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to push you a little bit Please. because what I heard 
uh, and you are president and CEO of the Business Council of Canada, is the government needs to do this yes. to defend uh, the Arctic. Um, we Our sovereignty is at risk. I didn't hear once a conversation about the people in the Arctic and the challenges they're facing. So I'm turning it back to mm -hmm. you as yep. CEO. What are you and industry doing to invest the infrastructure and to co-develop with the people in the Arctic how they can be economically viable because that, I think, is the key to sovereignty, to defense of the Arctic. Yeah, excellent question. I'm really glad you asked it. Um, and it is a shared responsibility. Uh, obviously, I've talked a lot about government, but the reason I talk a lot about government is, at the end of the day, uh, all of this requires capital. It all requires capital. And so for capital to be mobilized and deployed, you need the right um in, and you need the right framework for capital to form. And what we currently have today is an environment in which we have politicized foreign investment and we have politicized infrastructure development. And as a consequence, and the speech I gave at Ivy was basically, we don't build anything anymore. Today, we could not build the national highway or the national railway. We would be 10 countries. It wouldn't be possible to meet the standards that are being met. So when I talk about it from a government duty, my main message is create the environment and the, inf and, and, the, and the capacity for capital to be formed and mobilized. How do you do that? You offer political stability, regulatory predictability, and social cohesion, a country that, 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 that can function. I think we have two of those three things, political stability, we can debate about minority governments and all that, but overall, that's not the problem here. The problem here is regulatory predictability. Today, under Bill C-69, if you start a project, it may make economic sense, it may make environmental sense, it may make every sense that there is, except there's this political risk here now that says somewhere down the road, when the project is up for approval, the government of the day, well into the future, often five, six, seven years in the future, can say yay or nay to that project. So there's a reason there's no capital being formed here. And that's the problem. We're going to need a lot of money to develop it. So I just put that there as why we need to make sure we put pressure on our governments to not interfere in these processes, which we had never done before, by the way. And in fairness, it was the previous government who politicized this, right? They made these decisions go to cabinet. With all due respect, how many engineers are in cabinet? How many military people are in cabinet? How many business people are in cabinet? The answer is not many. So should we really be asking them to make these decisions when we've asked experts to make these decisions? Regulators who have been looking at this like the National Energy Board and, 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 and the, you know, the Investment Review Division and others, we probably shouldn't do that. But we have done that. And that's one of the reasons we have a problem. Secondly, that doesn't mean we can't do what you're asking for. So P3s, I think the P3s are our model. Uh, equity sharing, I mean, I think the, the Indigenous community story is a very positive one as we look forward. Um, the ones I interact with are, are particularly keen on development, are particularly clean on, on are, are particularly uh, keen on um, equity and wanting to do so in a responsible way, uh, sensitive to the environment, sensitive to their culture. Uh, and I think that's encouraging because that's the quote unquote social license we need to develop the infrastructure, right? Uh, many companies like TELUS and others have been in the North expanding broadband. And they're trying to do it in such a way that says, we want to give you the ownership of it. We're going to teach you how to run this yourself, right? Um, there are many skills and reskilling programs that are underway from corporations. The thing about it, and this is the tragedy, is we do a horrible job of telling our own stories because we just want to keep our head down. Because we think if we pop it up, the Canadian, you know, sort of curses, well, they must have done something wrong, rip something off them, right? And get them, get, make them, you know, go down. And so they hide. And so part of my job is to go out and do what I'm doing is to say, actually, Canadian businesses are forced for good. Just take a look at COVID. Yeah, government handed out a lot of money to a lot of people, but it was Canadian business who was responsible for making sure you were still employed for giving you the you know, capacity to use the broadband to build the PPEs that we didn't have. You know, like we have aerospace companies and automaker companies making ventilators. They didn't say anything about it. They just did it. Canada Goose stopped making, you know, winter garb and started making garb for our nurses and our doctors and stuff like that. There's a lot of things that were done um, that kept the economy going, that kept unemployment. It was actually 14.9% or something, but other countries had 25%. Why? I know members who paid their payroll 
knowing that there was no work because they said, you know what, they were with us during the bad times. We'll, uh, the good times, we'll be with them for the bad times. We just don't talk about it enough. So I think the equity piece of it is key. The energy infrastructure I did reference in my, in my remarks is one of the biggest challenges that we face to make sure that we have the power and the capacity to help um, uh, attract people to be there. If we're going to do a deep sea port, for example, you got to build a whole community around that. It's not just a port. And so we don't have the energy infrastructure. We don't have the energy infrastructure, by the way, right here. I mean, Kingston is going to be the pit stop for everybody driving their car from Ottawa to Toronto. That's an EV because we've got to stop and charge the car. But we don't have the infrastructure. We don't have the grids. And so that's part of my message here is we're jumping ahead of ourselves to what solutions we would like to see without realizing what enables those solutions to be possible. I'm very optimistic about the North. I'm very optimistic about the Indigenous communities. I'm very optimistic that Canadian business will be a partner um, and, and is doing its part. We can do more. Let me be clear. We can do more. It is going to be possible if we have a government that you can partner with that doesn't, in fact, impede on your ability to attract capital and to deploy it. But one of the last point, the, 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 I'd love my job. I never applied for it. I didn't want it because I didn't think they'd listen, but thankfully they are um, because I think they're worried about the future of the country as well. But my problem is I ask them every time I meet them, especially one-on-one, -on -one, what is your plans for investment uh, today uh, in the world? And more often than not, 90 cents is leaving the country. It's going to places, including America, where the capital is more welcome, where you can build the infrastructure, and you can realize your gains from that. And yes, we are in the gains business. And so if you can't do that here, it's harming us. Like, I ask you to think, what have you seen built in this country in a long time? Think about, give me three things we've built. Most of the building. That was my Ivy speech. It was in the 1950s and 60s and stuff. Most of it came after we had successfully fought two world wars saying, you know what? If we can do that, we can do this. Thank God for those people. They dreamt big dreams and they built the kinds of things we just take for granted every day. That was my message to these kids. This highway you're driving on every day, you just take it for granted. You know what it took to build that highway? Right? That's what we've gotten away from. And so I think the North can be a pilot project to some extent, if I can call it that. It's an opportunity to show in a smaller scale, we can do big things if we work together. Uh, there's a question at the back there. Todd. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Jeff Evan Me Hill from uh archipelago of design. I'm actually from Calgary as well. So I'm sympathetic to a lot of you, what you're saying. And my background is in uh, war games and business war games. And I'm curious when you say the energy transition and, and, the, and, the, and the Arctic uh, development, uh, when you talk, building on General Strickland's question, like uh, kind of order of operations and how do we build um, consensus or, or, or even some, some level of agreement when it comes to the order of operations of how we phase into these into these things, you said it's not an on-off switch for the transition. Um, what what kind of what kind of things have you been using for the council and, and yeah, otherwise? It's a very good question. Thank you. Um, so the result of the German visit was the prime minister got called out on some of this stuff and said, "Hey, we just sent a guy in the, the country back home with nothing," and they went out and got it everywhere else. And so this response was, "We need to uh, expedite." We need to expedite certain projects. So I've jumped on that, said, we agree. Let's sit down and talk about which ones we're going to expedite. At the very top of the list has to be anything that's going to actually decarbonize. That should be a no-brainer, right? If some new project is going to decarbonize and take emissions out of, the, out of the sky, do you know Canada's emission reduction since 2008, I believe it is, is 1%. One. Do you know between 2050 and 2019, the answer was zero? Do you know COVID actually didn't very little for, for emission reductions here and around the world? We just made a commitment for 40% reductions by 2030. That's like around the corner. And so in order for that to get going, we should expedite projects that are going to decarbonize. Right? That's the first thing. So uh, the government did listen to us. And, and I want to say, if there's an area and an issue in which we are working very closely with the government on, we don't like everything that they do, and that's, that shouldn't be the criteria, um, is on climate change. It is on climate change. So with Minister Gibbo, with Minister Wilkinson, um, Minister Freeland and others, to some extent, we have been able to say, here's what we need from you. At the end of the day, business has to innovate the solutions. Carbon capture is a concept. 
And by the way, carbon capture to a corporation is, a, is pretty much all cost. There's, there's no gas stations where we take the carbon and you come and buy it. It's a cost. It's a earlier point about civil duty. What are we doing? We're investing our dollars, your dollars as shareholders and others to carbon to capture carbon because it's the right thing to do. People expect us to do it, right? But we need your skin in the game. And so the government came up with about a 50% tax credit that allows us to say, okay, we're sharing that cost. We're hoping the province of Alberta and Saskatchewan jump in with a little bit more and that downloads the cost. The reason is that's what goes into the innovation strategy. That's how we're gonna be able to innovate more and more and more about the kinds of solutions that have to come about. SMRs are not ready today. They could be five to 10 years away. Hydrogen, the prime minister said to Germany, we're gonna have hydrogen in three years. Well, they clearly didn't believe them. They went out and got LNG for 16. People who are doing hydrogen are my members. They think it's five to 10 years out. And there's a lot of things that have to happen, including people have to realize how much water gets used to do hydrogen. Because that's the next thing the environmentalists are probably going to say, oh my God, there's too much water. I mean, the government of Quebec through Hydro-Quebec had an agreement with the state of New York, not Maine, not a, not a small state, the state of New York, to help reduce emissions through hydroelectricity, which is obviously a good thing to do. And the environmentalists said, well, no, hang on. You're going to have to take down trees in Maine to build the electricity. Yes. Yes, we are. And we'll plant a whole bunch of them somewhere else. But like, yes, if your agenda is to have us build nothing... <laughs> Tell us now, because I think that you'll lose support from the public. See Europe. See Europe. If you don't bring your public with you, it actually sets the climate progress back. That's why coal plants are running in Japan. That's why coal plants are, run, are being produced and made in India and China, because we haven't given them the solutions to get off that stuff. That's going to take a lot of, of capital uh, to do. So I'm urging the government to identify what projects we can expedite and how are we going to get our resources to market so the revenues from that can help the transition and fund it. Because otherwise, government is the only client that we can ever have. Government wants us to build something. Let us know. We'll build it for you. Please put your deposit here. Otherwise, we're not taking any risks. Can't take risks in the political environment that I've just described. Nobody in their right mind would say, I don't know how I'm going to be judged in seven years. Please apply and drop, you know, 500 million, 700 million, $800 million into a process. That's not the construction. It's just a process. So you can see why there's a chill, why there's so much money just sitting and or leaving the country. And we're going to pay the price for that. I, I know too much. That's my problem. That's why I'm anxious. I'm worried. You should be worried about how we get our politics right so that we can get going on some of the things that I'm talking about. Actually, we're going to take uh, one last question from online, just because it is uh, Senator Hugh Siegel, who has kindly invited you, but he's also asked the question. So, Oh, he's here. I didn't know he was well, here. I looked it's, it's actually online, online. Oh, okay. so uh, I won't quote his email address. Right. But um, Much of the opposition to increase defense expenditures comes from economists who point to much higher taxes. Were we to really invest, not the rounding error, Ottawa has proposed, but the doubling of expenditures likely required. Uh, do you, sir, believe corporate Canada would support this? So um, we believe in growth. We believe that you fund things through growth. We have an anemic economy here. It is basically a function of population growth. So Canadian GDP growth in a matter of just a few years will be 100% driven by the number of immigrants we let in the country. That's it. So when I said we don't have an industrial policy, that if you look at Germany, Korea, Japan, and by the way, what's the common denominator in all three of them? Two things. They emerged from ashes. It took a crisis. Okay? And secondly, none of them have anything in the ground. They only got what's between their ears. And look at the superpowers economically each one of those three have become. Okay. We are coasting. So we need a growth strategy for this country. We need an industrial policy from this country that grows the pie, not redistributes it. Because that's a, that's a limited game. You know, a populist measure was introduced the other day uh, after everything I just said, the banks, I never even mentioned banks. They gave mortgage relief for nine months. They did all kinds of things, right? None of this was laws, by the way. They did it because it was the right thing for them to do. The reward was a bank tax. <laughs> Really popular, 2%, except who do you think pays for that, right? 
the very people that everybody says they're getting elected for this middle class and the lower middle class well their their bank fees probably went up a quarter right like, like it's absurd to be populist and not realize that the outcome of that is not what you intend grow the pie grow the economy, build an industrial base in this country, leverage our natural, I'm not some shill for the oil and gas industry. I'm not just some Albertan or Calgarian. It's 10% of our GDP. If you want to turn it off, we can arrange that. And then let's see how life is without your healthcare system, which is already fragile, or your education system, which in many places in this country looks like it's from the 60s. What is it going to look like? We can turn it off, right? So we've got to diversify, we've got to grow our economy, we've got to build our base so more people are paying less taxes, not le less people are paying more taxes because those people have choices. They leave. They leave. Whether it's corporate capital or individual capital, it leaves. And so all of these burdens get passed on. I mean, like we're at 50, I'm at 55% in Ontario tax rate. That's pre-GST, you know, pre-PST, pre-land transfer tax. I don't drink, so alcohol tax or gas tax, you name it. So what am I really paying? 65, 70 cents of my is going to the government? What am I getting back for that? Why am I here? Right? That's what people are going to start asking themselves. And yes, it's the greatest country in the world and has all these things going for it. But do you really have a healthcare system? Ask people. Do you, do you really have the best infrastructure system? Look at our roads. Do you really have the best? We, this is a challenge for all of us that we, need to, uh, that we need to meet. And so an industrial strategy, an industrial policy that grows our economy, DARPA is based in the Department of Defense. <laughs> right? Everything that came out of that, that we were a contributor for, the whole industrialized economy was built around defense. So I think it's an opportunity for you in your own way, recognizing your nonpartisanship and your role as public servants in many cases and others, to start articulating about what you need, which ironically is what we're advocating for, which is growth. Okay, thank you.